This is Joe Franco, Chair of the Region 2 Stakeholder Advisory Committee um, here uh, for the Anne Arundel County. Really excited to be back with you all um, and chairing this and wanted to thank um, our Vice Chair, Keisha Baird, for uh, hosting the call uh, last month. And she did a fantastic job. And I know there was a lot of great conversation around housing um, in Anne Arundel County. And I know that we're actually going to talk more about housing at a later date because there's um, a lot to unpack there, which I think is really, really important. Um, but we do have some great speakers tonight um, from the Health Department, the Department of Aging and Disabilities, as well as the Department of uh, Recreation and Parks. So we're really excited tonight. So lots, lots of key things. Really encourage SAC members to uh, ask questions uh, and also kind of help dive into these deep areas because I think these are going to be uh, some really great presentations that are going to help us think about the resources that we need for District 2 and then how do we kind of make sure that it's accessible to everybody. So I think that's really, really important. So with that, um, we definitely want to confirm tonight's agenda. So is there a motion from someone to confirm tonight's agenda? I'll make the motion. All right, great. Kevin, I have a second. I, I see April. Okay, uh, I'll give it to April this time, and then Kimmy will get you for the, the other one. Uh, so anybody, uh, any other additions without any uh, abstentions? Okay, great, we'll confirm the agenda for tonight. Um, and then I was not here for the July meeting, so I definitely will need someone to, uh, to see, are there any questions or any updates we need for the July meeting notes? No? Okay, well then, uh, do we have a motion to approve the July SAC notes? Kimmy, do you wanna, do you wanna move to, to approve? Yes, yes. Okay, great, Kimmy will, okay. And then do we have a second? April, okay, so we'll have April uh, second those. Okay, and without any other additions or edits or um, anybody opposed, we will approve our July meeting notes. So that's great. And once again, thank you to Keisha. I know she'll join us here soon, but she did a fantastic job. It was great to watch the recording and see how well she did. So really, really glad that you all are in great hands. Um, so with that, I think, you know, we have a lot of really key things to some great pieces today. Hope uh, we can really have a great conversation with these, these great speakers from the county. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Mark, who's going to kind of give a little bit of an introduction and overview, and then we're going to dive right into um, our, our sections. So Mark, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Joe. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, and, and thank you for attending. Um, so again, just some housekeeping here. Um, really just want to emphasize that this meeting is being recorded, and it will be then posted up onto our website uh, probably by early next week then. Okay. So again, the agenda that was just approved, uh, just give a, an overview here. We'll have a series of presentations by the Health Department, our Department of Aging and Disabilities, Recreation and Parks. And then following up from our, our last meeting or our meeting back in July, um, we had everybody um, or everybody was given a set of dots and we had the recommendations on housing from Plan 2040 up around the room. And if you remember, we, we asked you to, to vote on what your, or what you felt were the most important strategies um, from plan 2040. So we can recap what the, what the sort of results were or, or summary from that and those next steps. And then the feedback map, uh, which was open to the public to comment on, that closed back in, in June. And so we've got a, a summary of, of those results or those, uh, those comments as well. Um, and then you sort of sense that we're, we're coming to the end of these topical meetings and we're gonna start to hit that next phase of this process. So we'll, we'll just recap what the, uh, sort of where we've been and what our next steps are, and then allow some time for public comment. So again, always just wanna, I'll, you know, give us this opportunity to touch base and remind ourselves, um, you know, what, what this is about and, with this region plan, again, we really want to identify current conditions, identify where those gaps are, and then ultimately develop this vision of where region two wants to be in the next 20 years. And so as it relates to land use. Um, so that also includes environmental protection, transportation improvements, um, as well as uh, public facilities. And ultimately then, 
you know, what this does is this really feeds into then when the office planning and zoning needs to make any rezonings, this plan can help inform any of those types of decisions. It can also be sort of a guide um, as far as uh, any future capital improvements that the county or even potentially the state um, could make in region two. Okay, so moving on then to the community's roles and responsibilities. Um, again, all this information is really found in your charter, but we just wanna remind you that um, as members of the uh, SAC, we're really looking for you to, to come to these meetings, um, just you know, be a sponge, take in this information, and then share it out into the community and also then sort of get any uh, feedback from the community on, on any of these issues that we're talking about and then bring them back um, to these meetings as well. Um, so again, we're sort of making this, you know, we're turning a corner and um, you know that this this sort of uh, this phase where we're sharing information, we're now going to start to sort of put you know pencil to paper and and sort of uh, jot down what these recommendations would look like, or sort of what this direction and vision uh, for Region Two is going to look like. So again, we always just want to um, remind folks that if you have any questions or comments about the process, like Carrie or myself or Joe or Keisha know so that we can answer any of those questions or work to address any of those issues. Okay, so, so you might be thinking, what does health have to do with land use planning, right? So the presentations today are focused on healthy communities and health equity. Joe touched on that um, earlier, a couple minutes ago. Defined by the planning, American Planning Association as the ability of people to attain their highest level of health, regardless of who they are, where they live. So if you also think about it, we just want a high quality of life for all, okay? So you might be wondering what this has to do, and we're talking, um, you know, because a lot of this, a lot of health outcomes are determined by genetics. So according to the APA, there are these five pillars of healthy communities that are directly affected by land use planning. For example, the ability of someone to live in an active lifestyle depends um, depends in part on whether they live physically near to opportunities for recreation or whether their neighborhood's design allows them to walk or bike safely. Or the ability of someone to breathe in uh, clean air depends in part on whether there is adequate tree canopy in their neighborhood or whether they live far enough away from pollution. So in other words, land use policies have a big role to play in whether residents can live their healthiest lifestyles. So if you think about it, we've already touched or, or addressed a lot of these pillars in one way or another in these previous discussions and presentations that we've heard. Okay, so today we're um, joined by the Department of Health, Department of Aging and Disabilities, and the Department of, Recre um, Department of Recreation and Parks. Um, they're going to offer a bit more information about the gaps and opportunities in our region to build a healthier community. So from our Department of Health, and they'll kick things off, is Alexis Barnes. She's the Program Manager for Healthy Anne Arundel, again from the Department of Health. Um, from our Department of Aging is Carissa Kelly, the Director, and our Capital Projects Manager from the Department of Recreation and Parks is Bruce Brucci. So um, with that, I'll stop sharing and um, Alexis, if you're ready to, to share, go for it. I am, you stole some of my thunder with your uh -oh. eloquent, <laughs> with your eloquent explanation of something that is very dear to my heart, which is of course, social determinants of health. Um, hello everybody. Again, my name is Alexis Barnes. I am the program manager for the Healthy Anne Arundel Coalition, which I will talk about very briefly at the end after sharing some data that we pulled on region two. Um, this is the first, uh, my first time at one of these meetings. So apologies if I repeat anything that you already know or that you've heard before at previous meetings, but um, it was very interesting for me to dive into West County, which I don't work often in. So 
as you know, this is the region that we're working with right now, covering um, communities of Jessup, Annapolis, Junction, Laurel, Maryland City, and parts of Hanover, uh, the Patuxent Wildlife Re Research Refuge, and the Fort George Mead um, area, which is very interesting to find data on because um, you're going to see a bunch of maps and I'm going to explain them in a in a friendly way that will be less datafied. But um, when we get our data, our public health data, it's usually very free and accessible. Um, but sometimes, particularly in the uh, base area, they don't share that information with us and they have their own public health controls. And so we don't sometimes have everything for that region. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, and move on to the next part. So today we're going to talk about uh, these data topics of discussion, uh, median household income, food access, walkability, green space, um, and some of the non-communicable diseases in the area, particularly cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And for the same question of land use planning, it's like, why are we talking about some of these things when we're talking about public health? Because they are very integral parts of the social determinants of health that um, inform whether people are going to have positive health outcomes or uh, not positive health outcomes. And you can see on the right, that's, of course, access to healthcare, which everybody thinks about, but then the other things that were discussed at the top were education, economic stability, social and community context, and then for this meeting, the neighborhood and the built environment. And so, we work, uh, my program in particular, uh, HACK, which is Healthy Anne Arundel Coalition, we work very closely with our health equity and racial justice team. And I can have contact information for anybody that's interested. And um, I'm gonna go back to this screen. Uh, some of the things that we work on that is not what people would think about is affordable childcare, for example. Many of our community members have challenges for affordable housing. Um, and so we do, assist with rent and utility assistance. We have community health ambassadors that not only do health information like you would assume, but were crucial during the height of the pandemic for infection prevention. And we're also trained on mental health first aid so that in the future they can become more equipped to address community concerns. And I bring this up because this is very important to our work at the Department of Health, making sure that more people have access to information, to resources, and our community health ambassadors are very, very crucial to that aim. So median income, uh, household income for region two, I pulled it out as well so you can see some of the diff variations in color. The darker the color, the higher, the, the lower, excuse me, the median income, which ranges from 48,000 to about 72. And then the highest you can see is 142 to 196. And so for region two, we have pockets of the lowest um, section of income, but the majority of it is in that middle income region between uh, 72,000 and 116. And why this is important is that income is a basic indicator of social class and pays, plays a pretty dominant role in the maintenance of health. The higher your income is related to better health outcomes and lower health risks, while lower income means more exposure to health risks and um, adverse health outcomes, including shorter life expectancy, higher infant mortality rates, and higher death rates uh, for the nation's 14 leading causes of death. Um, income status also affects the built environment, the places where people live, where they work and play, including the buildings, the open spaces, and the infrastructure. So food access for this region, I have two maps on this slide. The one on the left in the green are the percentage of households that are enrolled in SNAP um, and or receiving food benefits. And so when I pulled it out, I wanted you to be able to see, keeping in mind what I told you about, particularly the refuge area and the army area, uh, the military area, is that there's a low enrollment in SNAP for the most part, but it does get up to 10% in the eastern, the western part of the region. And on the right side in the blue map, you can see the low income census tract with low access to food. And what that means is for urban areas, if you can find access to 
food, fresh food in less than half of a mile. And then for rural, more rural areas, that number is 10 miles. And so eating a healthy diet is difficult without access to these nutritious foods. And that also goes in hand with transportation, um, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, poor diets lead to chronic illnesses, such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes, which we'll get into in um, the upcoming slides, and obesity. Um, low income and minority communities in particular often lack the convenient places that offer these affordable healthy food options, which again, do not lean into positive health outcomes. Green space in our region, we all know of the wildlife refuge, there is a lot of green space there, but having green space and having access to it are two different things. And so um, excess heat, especially in urban areas with reduced natural cover, uh, people don't know, but it can cause cardiovascular stress and heat stroke and other major health issues, especially those with existing chronic medical conditions like heart disease, diabetes, and respiratory conditions like asthma and COPD. And so in our region, of course, it's highly green in the parks area. And um, even there's pockets of the green way, which is the checkered uh, green coloring that you see. But again, it is important to take note of green space existing and the option for people, the access of people via transportation to actually get there and utilize it. But there is excellent cover in this region, which is as expected. Um, hand in hand with green space is the walkability. And so walkability in your community motivates you to get out, to have physical activity, and it promotes health. And so when you're looking at walkability index in this data, it combines a myriad of factors that affect whether residents of an area can safely walk around and access business and transit. So it's not just public health. Um, and region two, as you can see in the upper left corner, it scores range from predominantly least walkable, which is that lightest green color um, in the south and in the north and a little bit in central, and then the pockets of the above average walkable, which is that middle green and that darker green. And so we don't have most walkable, but there is a big chunk of least walkable, which means that uh, people cannot safely walk. Perhaps there's not pathways, sidewalks, perhaps it's a lot of industry. Um, which brings us to our non-communicable diseases. And I started up top so that you can hopefully maybe see some trends in the area that you're seeing certain data show up in. On the left side, you'll see the inpatient and emergency department encounters for a cardiovascular disease, which is a bunch of things that impact your heart. Um, and on the right, you'll see diabetes. And so this region reports relatively low incidences of inpatient and emergency department encounters for CVD and diabetes compared to the county at large. These two maps I didn't break out because I did want you to see a bit of a comparison between the rest of the county. Um, and so on the left, uh, the rates are, they range from 12.1 to 94, 5.3 cases per 10,000 individuals in the population. And for diabetes, that number is 4.5 to 35.9 per 1,000. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview of my program because we do lean into connecting people uh, and reviewing the social determinants of health that might be barriers for individuals to have access to the things that they need to, to be well. And so in case you don't know, the Healthy Anne Arundel Coalition is a countywide collaborative led by the Department of Health, but more importantly, it's made up of community organizations, faith-based institutions, our churches, um, economic development organizations and nonprofits, health centers, hospitals, and our sister county government agencies. And we all have a goal of working together with community members to identify and address communities' priority health needs and to align resources within each member organization to achieve common goals. One of the issues in the county is that we do have a lot of resources that are available. A lot of people do not know about them or they overlap and they're not used efficiently. And so we work to listen to the community and try to connect them to the things that they need. And um, our focus areas are mental health and wellness, obesity slash diabetes, COVID-19, and access to healthcare. Um, some of the 
recommendations that we have are things that have come out of community meetings. And I find that land use planning and public health are very much uh, in sync, uh, like was mentioned up top. And a lot of the feedback and commentary has, is always transportation, the route, access to it. Um, if you don't have a car in the county, it's very difficult to not only work, but get the things that you need to be healthy and well, um, affordable childcare, uh, and access to safe green spaces that people feel like they can be outside and not have to worry about traffic, violence, and the like in order to be outside. And so my contact information is at the bottom left. And if you have any questions, you can ask me now, of course, but um, I also wanted to share that email address if you want to be a part of the coalition or if you had any questions or wanted to plug into our work. Thank you. Well, great, Alexis. That was really, really great overview. Very, very helpful. Um, so I think what I'll do is if folks could use the, I know I know it's been a while since we use Zoom, but if you could use the reactions, there's a, a raise your hand feature, or if you just want to raise your hand, um, you know, we can definitely, we definitely have time for questions, which I think is really helpful. So um, yeah, uh, Kevin, looks like you have a question. And you're on mute at the moment. Yes, I do. And there uh, you are. I can hear you. I, I, I was, yeah, I, I, I was looking at the walkability index uh, and um, I was, it was interesting. It seemed like from what I was looking at was uh, there's a strip along Route 175 that was better than awful. Um, I see. You. <laughs> yeah, you're going to. And uh, there's a little bit of green just straight above the two. I think that's the parkway yeah, a little further up. A little for yeah, right in there, and that implies that Jessup Road is walkable, and it's not. Um, I I just put in uh, there's there's a walk score website, and I just put that in. Yes, you're familiar with that. And I just put that in, and and I get uh, for my address on Jessup Road, I get a walk index of seven out of a hundred, which is awful. So I'm I'm wondering why that bit of green got in there because that entire area is not walkable. <laughs> there it is. You could do it too. Just type in 2885 Jessup Road and you'll you'll get a seven also. <laughs> so that is interesting. So the analytics that we use for this walkability score, well, clearly they're not lining up with, with the experience that people have. And so that I am gonna make a note of that because um, they base that walkability score on like a metrics, a methodology. Um, and so, yeah, I'll look into that. Yeah, so maybe the website's in, um, way of scoring is different from yours, but, but yeah. Uh, in fact, during the height of COVID, uh, my wife and daughter and I went out walking along once at Route 175, and it was it was quite eye opening. It's just like, oh, this would be nice if it wasn't for, you know, thousands of smoke belching tractor trailers going by every second as it is now. So, yeah, but uh, I, I yeah, that, so that's I take I, I think it, the walk score should be much worse than what you're showing. Yeah, I, I will second that, Kevin. That was going to be one of my questions slash thoughts was. I was a little surprised at how well our region was in that walkability. Um, and so, um, like I said, I mean, I, I think it's helpful, right? Data's data, but I also feel like there's a lot of areas that aren't very walkable unless you live in like a planned community part of the district. Um, the other areas, you'll have a sidewalk that will just end and then there's no sidewalk. So if you're in a wheelchair or a bike, you're riding along and then suddenly there's just nowhere for you to go except the busy street. So, um, you know, I do think that there are some pockets that do have a lot of walkability, but I do think that there's also kind of a, a mix of places. So I, I definitely agree with you, Kevin. I was a little surprised at how well our region did. Um, but I also think, you know, it's something that we, when we did, uh, Alexis, just so you know, we did a driving tour in the early spring where we actually took vans and we drove around. And I think that was one of the major things that we came up with and as we were driving around the district was, uh, or during the region is the fact that in just some areas, there's just no resources to be able to walk safely. Um, or if you have a disability, you're not going to be able to move around that easily because of that. So, um, so we do know that that's something that's important. So any, any other 
follow up, Kevin, or was that? No, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, oh, Carrie. I just want to add a pitch that um, I think this is a really interesting conversation. And one of the great values that the SAC brings is like, you guys are helping us ground truth our data. So um, for the feedback map, we got a lot of really excellent very highly specific feedback, not to like jump ahead of into Mark's presentation, but about, you know, this block of this street is really dangerous. So I just want to go back and thank everyone for their participation in that and just reiterate the importance of continuing to kind of like bring these first person, um, like qualitative experiences to the conversation. So great opportunity to help us uh, observe the right things here. Well, staying on this path, and of course, I will. Anybody can jump in and just either raise your hand or get my attention as I speak. I don't want to monopolize. Um, so, like one of the thoughts. So, on one hand, I was really excited. I used to actually work for the American Diabetes Association, so I was really glad <laughs> to see the diabetes rates lower than in other parts of the county. My only other question for you is, and you may not know the answer, but just something I wanted to state is, how skewed is the data in regards to health? due to the fact that we have so many military folks at Fort Meade because they, for their jobs, have to be in very good shape. So do you feel that having the military base and people that work there makes our health our health numbers look better than other parts of the county? That's an excellent point. And I want to say yes and no, because there are, okay. there are also um, uh, topics that we'll try to pull and you saw all the colors on the maps and those areas will just be whited out and we have no access to them. So sometimes they're not even counted in what we can pull from our, our Maryland databases. Um, gotcha. For the times that we can, you're absolutely right, it would skew um, because there would be higher rates of positive <laughs> health um, metrics and outcomes. And so, but that's something I do want to talk to our Epidemi epidemiologists about too, because that's an excellent point of how it could might paint a different picture to the average resident that is not enlisted, for example. Yeah, it would just, like I said, don't need it for today, but it would just, at some point, the data nerd in me would be very interested if you took out those folks that their job depended on their PT exams, <laughs> and there's regular folks like me, like, how would that, you know, would it look a little more like the rest of the county or not, uh, which I think would be really valuable. Um, and I think that's one thing we've seen that's really been positive for West County um, is that we have seen developments and we've seen a change in adding more grocery stores um, and different price point grocery stores. So I think that that's helping too, as we're seeing, you know, some Aldi's come into the area, Lidl's, um, you know, we're, we're seeing kind of a different mix of food purveyors, you know, Walmart, you know, the Walmarts have, have grocery stores. So you know, we're kind of seeing different price points, which I'm hoping is helping with kind of the food food desert situations that typically we see in other spots. Um, but I'd like to know other folks' thoughts on that. If folks think that, you know, is region two missing, you know, should we be having more farmers markets? Do we feel that food is accessible? Is it not accessible? Because um, I think that's an important part of this equation too, is that do people have the ability to eat healthy and live a healthy lifestyle? Or is that something that's a burden? And I think things have improved since I've moved here a long time ago, but maybe folks have different thoughts and I'm, you know, would like to hear what other SAC members think. Yeah, Kimmy. Sorry, thank you so much. There we go. Yeah. I was going to go to that aspect um, regarding the grocery store, like for instance, Whole Food in in this region, I feel like we don't have a lot of um, other, like in terms of organic, like farmer's market. Um, I have to go to Prince George's to go to the Hamish market or have to go to Montgomery County to go to a farmer's market. I don't, in, a, in this region, I haven't seen a farmer's market that I can comfortably go to that is closer. I have to drive a little further outside of the region to go to a farmer's market. So I think it would be good if we have more options I mean, it's, I mean, I like the idea that our region, in terms of health-wise, um, that you know, the, the um, diabetes um, type two is de definitely lower compared to other region. 
but it would be nice if we can have more variety when it comes to different grocery stores. Um, it's good that we're having Audi, which is more on the cheaper side, but it would be good to have more options of farmer's market. That's great. Any other thoughts for Department of Health? It's been really helpful. Okay, well, okay. Yeah, can, yeah. can we go ahead? Yeah. yeah, I wanted to go back to the um, income um, presentation. I'm kind of curious um, in terms of the income. I'm not sure if it's okay to kind of show that again. Is it showing? Okay, so yeah, that, you so that um, section that is like um, dark purple. Which area is that? Which uh, which color? The, the dark purple. The dark, yeah, the dark purple, like the very dark one, the one that has forty eight thousand to seventy two. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's hard to see without lines. I mean, my my guess and others can help me is they're kind of looking at, I mean, it looks like that would be part of Maryland City, probably parts of Russet, okay. um, and then kind of going up towards the base is what I would, would be my guess. Okay. And maybe it's a little bit towards the racetrack. I don't know, Mark, maybe Mark Thompson can divine his eyes too, but that, that <laughs> kind of would be my guess of where those are at. That's what I was thinking, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. Sorry, I'm moving while I have it shared. I wanted to go back to see if we had went down to um, the city name level. So, yeah, what was what was said already? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and then I, I guess just kind of as a final question before we head on to our next piece is just anything you would recommend, Alexis, that we consider as we come out of the pandemic and any lessons from COVID? Like, are there things that we should be thinking about that we've learned from COVID that we should definitely have in our communities for the next 20 years? That is a question of a lifetime. I also am interested in getting the data, the most recent data, which uh, we had, we only had access up to some of our data points 2020 and there was one 2021 um, due to data uh, issues with Maryland State. But I think I would like to see the, the most recent data because I think none of it will look like what it looks like now from a state down to a county level. Um, I think everybody's indicators will be down from income, mm -hmm. from uh, mental health wellness. I think there will be increased need for um, spaces that foster better mental wellness, um, increased access to care now since people have been putting off, um, and sorry, this is my public health hat, but since people have been during the pandemic putting off their primary care services, um, the ones that were then minor that are now major issues, um, and then out every, everything else based on what I said increased, uh, these are pie in the sky, but transportation is talked about all the time and access to more public transportation options. But, um, that is the prevailing commentary that we get at our community meetings. Um, and a lot of the financial things that I don't think land use planning will be helpful for, but the affordable, um, child care, for example, and affordable mm -hmm. housing, which is land use planning. But um, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. No, no, no. I just, I just thought I figured I'd ask you. Keisha, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, hi, Alexis. Thanks for that presentation. Uh, I was curious, do you have like, I guess, a, a kind of a generalized amount that you could think of that would be considered like um, affordable for, for child care? I'm just kind of curious to hear that. I do not off the top of my head. I thought you were going to say affordable housing and I was like ready. And then you said child care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that figure um, off the top of my head. No, but I can find it while we're talking and drop it in the chat. Okay. Thank you. 
I do just also want to add that child care locations are sometimes a land use issue. So that's something for us to keep in mind when we get to that portion of the plan is whether or not uh, yeah. child care is a permitted use. We'll get there. Yeah, I think the other interesting thing, Alexis, that uh, you're, will probably come to your guys' plates and, and everybody else in the county is, depending on how the election goes in regards to recreational marijuana, how will that then play out too as you have, you know, recreational marijuana sites, where are those located, what are the health implications from those, so um, probably have some idea from what's currently out there, but um, yeah, that's something that we'll have to like consider, I think, as well, if, if, if that passes via via referendum this fall because that has a very specific health outcome if you know there's more access to marijuana all right well um i think with that we really appreciate that alexis and i think we're ready to go to our next presentation so mark you want to introduce our next speaker yeah hi chris uh so chris is from our department of age she's the director of our department of aging and disabilities so I'll hand it over to you, Krista. Hey, right, thank you. All right, so I, um, again, Carissa Kelly, Director of the Department of Aging and Disabilities. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed the first slide because this is today's generation of older adult. Um, today's generation of older adult and moving forward, um, they want to live active lifestyles. They have a significant um, uh, philosophy of health and wellness, um, and they want to be social, uh, which we know, you know, didn't happen very frequently in the pandemic. Uh, and during that time, I had to unfortunately close my senior activity centers, nursing homes, assisted livings, um, you know, had, you know, infrequent or no visitation. Uh, but this is really your population, your resident in front of you uh, on where they want to be. So we serve older adults, individuals with disabilities, uh, family, unpaid caregivers, and professional caregivers, and really have learned to serve anyone interested in planning for their future. Because it's very important in this day and age to serve uh, an individual uh, that's planning for their future rather than reactively on the back end. Uh, many people think that we are the Department of Senior Activity Centers, um, but I will let you know that we have 23 programs in 24 locations throughout the county, and really our Senior Activity Centers um, division is just one of the many programs. Um, I would gladly present to any civic uh, organizations and go into a greater reach, but I realize that we don't have a lot of time in this meeting. I, I can touch on a few of our services, as you've heard, our senior activity centers. Uh, and then we operate um, 21 uh, nutrition sites in addition to those senior activity centers that also house nutrition sites. Uh, we have a senior care program. Uh, this provides... Um, uh, individuals with um, personal care, chore services, and case management um, to help them age in place within their homes because it's one, where they want to be. Uh, we also have resource navigators. We have two customer service locations in the county. One is in Glen Burnie and one is in Annapolis uh, where you can come in, uh, walk in at any time, and you will get served immediately. Uh, you'll get greeted by a resource navigator, um, you know, and looking at equity, diversity, and inclusion. We have recently given the two um, other greater populations in our county have added uh, bilingual resource navigators. So um, they're bilingual in the two um, dominant languages of Korean uh, and Spanish speaking. Uh, so we did that, add that in. And, you know, all of these programs are available in all regions and all parts of the county. Um, and you can also call uh, and immediately um, speak to a resource navigator without having to be transferred 11 times. Um, we really do pride ourselves on our good customer service for an older adult or an individual with a disability or, um, you know, a, a family caregiver Really, there, there is no time for added stress, um, so they need to be able to 
get a service and, and receive service immediately. So demographics. Um, so we are one of five counties that older adults live in, uh, and I define that by 60 years and older. One of five counties that 62% of older adults in the state of Maryland live in. So this is where people are retiring and where they're aging in place. Um, if you look at the stat that's from the Maryland state plan, I think there's even a more recent one that I could have got, I'm sorry about that. Um, but by 2030, you know, uh, we're predicted to have a 40% change of older adults in our county. So this is this is a faster place, uh, pace than our school-aged children. In Region 2, if you look at um, the, the amount of older adults, Region 2 has about 9,000, 10,000 uh, individuals who are 60 and older. So I saw one of the questions, um, what do older adults want in this area? They want an age-friendly community. Uh, they wanna be able to meet their basic needs. They wanna live at home for as long as possible uh, with resources to support them, which we provide. They don't want typically to go on to a next level of care uh, unless they absolutely have to. And a next level of care would be a large um, assisted living or, or a nursing home. So people wanna stay where they are in their neighborhoods. Um, they wanna maximize their independence. You know, uh, if you look at nursing homes, um, if you look at large assisted uh, living facilities, those, those big institutions, um, you know, they're upwards of 80,000, 100,000 plus, depending on what you choose. Um, if you look at aging in place and living in your home with supplemental supports of maybe handyman services or uh, home delivered meals or some personal care within your home, um, it's significantly less expensive for the individual and the taxpayer, and it really is where people want to be. They want to be social. They want to be engaged. They want to, at 75 years old, attend a community college class. Um, so they want to um, uh, uh, stay, you know, um, stay well, stay focused, um, be around friends, be around families, um, yeah, have meaningful relationships. Uh, another thing that 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 older adults want is to uh, optimize, you know, their mental health, their well-being. Um, at the Department of Aging, um, we are offering, you know, grief uh, programs and counseling, uh, and I know our core mental health agency offers several uh, mental health programs, which older adults were the most impacted um, individual in this county during the pandemic. Um, either they were living in nursing homes or assisted livings, unable to communicate or see friends and families, uh, you know, having to schedule um, vaccinations on um, a system that was online, uh, which is where we can play, uh, kind of where we actually, um, Department of Aging and Disabilities and Department of Health and all county entities came together to create a vaccination line where we serve 17,000 older adults that could just call in and we would help them with their vaccinations and boosters. Uh, our community outreach um, is something that we pride ourselves on uh, because we have those two customer service locations in polarized ends of the county. Uh, we need to ingrain ourselves within the community. So we have outreach specialists that frequently um, go into Fort Meade, um, into the community-based outpatient clinic, Meade Army Community Service, Parkway Village Mobile Home Park. Um, these are the folks that need us um, and we need to be in front of them. Uh, it's very difficult if you're an older adult or an individual with a disability to maybe take two buses or to have a cab ride or have a loved one caregiver bring you all the way to Annapolis or all the way to Glen Burnie. Uh, so we make sure that we frequently have touch points within region two uh, to make sure that we are accessible. Uh, closest in proximity, um, like I said, we have seven senior activity centers um, peppered throughout the county. Closest in proximity to Region 2 is the O'Malley Senior Activity Center in Odenton. Talking, um, you know, yet again about that next generation of older adult in our county, um, we've partnered with the Anne Arundel Community College 
and members um, of this uh, senior activity center can attend college classes. Um, you know, if you're uh, if you're an older adult, um, it, it's unlimited, um, which is a wealth of, of, of benefit to the individual who wants to stay engaged and involved. Um, we focused in on fitness centers, classes, art, um, and any kind of special interest, um, you know, class at the center that older adults want to see um, within those five walls. Um, we also have volunteer opportunities for older adults. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, son or daughter, they don't live within Anne Arundel County. Um, so this is an opportunity for them to contribute back and stay involved, especially in Region 2, where we have some retired military. Um, those individuals uh, have a lifelong of service um, and want to stay active and involved um, in, in serving their community in different ways. Um, new and probably two generations plus of, uh, of, of, of want within this community, or I'm sorry, two decades plus, um, we are building the Severn Intergenerational Center. Um, this is a very, very, very new concept um, for the Senior Activity Center Network and that um, this facility will be um, intergenerational. Uh, it will house a boys and girls club. It will house a senior activity center. And most importantly, it will house this community. Um, this community has waited a very, very long time for a community center. Um, so this is a state of the art. Um, new age function of uh, a typical building uh, that we build in this county. And this will be next to the Van Bocklin Elementary School, and it will be a 20,000 square foot center. And these are the actual design um, that, that the construction is based off of. Um, members will have access to classes covering a wide range, uh, an array of services and activities and resources. Um, and this center will also operate as a congregate meal program through the Senior Nutrition Program. So we will provide um, uh, people that register for a daily lunch, um, meals, we do special meals in the community. We do cultural meals um, based on what that community wants. So this is very exciting. Um, but this was a, a, a very large partnership led by uh, Arundel Community Development, um, ACDS, uh, Casino Live, Maryland State Department of Aging. Um, you know, really uh, this county executive brought this 20 year dream into a reality. So we're very proud and it's supposed to open spring of 2023. Uh, just to highlight, um, as you wanted earlier, a little bit of information about food. So one, I think our second largest program is all about food. It's our senior nutrition program. Uh, so we operate nutrition sites um, at, at different um, senior high rises, senior activity centers. I've listed, we've got Friendship Station in there, Severn Intergenerational to come, and we provide healthy meals to older adults. Um, we also, within that program, have a home delivered meal program where individuals who are homebound, we will schedule and deliver um, meals to their home. Uh, and then we also um, have our senior nutrition farmer's market program uh, where individuals can get vouchers that they can take. Um, in this area, we, our participation is um, Piney Orchard Farmer's Market. Um, so they can take um, the vouchers to uh, the farmer's market and get fr uh, fresh food, uh, fruits and vegetables. And then newest um, uh, to this program is our Shop and Eat, where individuals can come to a senior activity center, O'Malley, or the upcoming Severn Intergenerational, and they will receive nutrition counseling um, and also um, be provided a, a local grocery store gift card. Um, that they can uh, pick up at half price. Challenges, and this is not just our county, this is not just our state. Our health department uh, mirrored exactly what I was going to say. Um, you know, if you look, transportation, options for older adults to allow them to move freely, um, accessible transportation, 
accessible sidewalks and curb cuts and crossable streets um, that, uh, that a wheelchair um, can get by if you have a disability, um, that a walker can roll on, um, you know, without barrier. Um, so that's, that's important. And this is, you know, really a national challenge. Uh, she talked about affordable housing. I like to talk about it as market rate housing. Um, something that, you know, if you are a teacher, a retired teacher, and you have a pension of maybe 1500 to 2000, um, and your only other source of fixed income is your social security benefit, something that you can purchase and live in, uh, you know, with that life experience, you know, and dedication. Um, you've worked a long time in public service and you can't afford an apartment to live in. Uh, you know, I talked earlier about um, nursing homes and uh, large, large assisted livings, um, but looking at small community-based assisted livings. These are your quietest neighbors. These are your four to 16 bed facilities um, that typically only have one or two staff caring for residents in the neighborhoods that you live in. Um, there's only one car in the driveway. There's not, um, as a typical household, mom's car, dad's car. Um, I have probably five in mind because I have teenagers. Um, but these are your quietest neighbors. We have 108 four to 16 bed living, uh, assisted living facilities in this county in residential neighborhoods. I have one in mind just right down the street. Um, these are a lower cost option for your retired policeman, your retired teacher um, that are living off, you know, a, a fixed income off a lifetime of service. Um, some of these facilities charge between 2,500 and 3,500 uh, a month compared to your your larger facilities. Um, so we we really need more of them. Um, access to geriatric mental health services and facilities. Um, there are not many in this county, and it is so very important as you age um, because you have to differentiate between mental health and cognition. And a geriatrician is going to understand that best. Currently, uh, in order to get that service, you have to go up to, you know, Baltimore City to find this very specialized field. So those, I, I would say, are, are the chief challenges. And again, they're not innate to this county. New initiatives. Um, we have now uh, implemented a Veteran Services Coordination Center. Uh, so Anne Arundel County Department of Aging and Disabilities has partnered with iCommunity Connection Services uh, to provide care and resource navigation for all veterans. Uh, you can call 410-222-3500 and be immediately linked with someone um, that is um, has a special emphasis in uh, VA disability, um, veteran services and is able to help you navigate sometimes a very complicated benefit. Uh, we've also just launched two months ago our assistive technology loan program. Uh, so individuals with disabilities, um, all ages, all residents uh, can identify through a catalog on our website uh, a piece of assistive technology to help with communication or mobility that they would like to try out. And they try it out for three weeks. Um, and if it works for them and maximizes their independence, uh, they can come in and we will work on a grant to be able to help them purchase the device that helps them. So very proud of that um, new initiative. And again, that is on our website. I did mention earlier the bilingual resource navigators. But we've, we've, we realized that housing is a huge issue, uh, even more so uh, post-pandemic, and that a lot of um, individuals had financial barriers to paying rents, to paying mortgages, the moratorium was lifted, uh, and now we are, we are trying to prevent eviction. And this is a, this is a, a countywide effort right now. Um, so we have hired a housing navigator that's able to um, have a really deep understanding of available and affordable houses, housing within this county, uh, as well as accessible housing, and able to help that individual match 
their income, their need, or apply for a benefit um, that can help support them staying in this county and being uh, a, a continued resident. Again, we talked earlier, you know, COVID really did um, affect our older adults, um, not just from, you know, a, a health perspective, but um, social perspective. A lot of our older adults were the ones to lose a spouse, um, to lose a friend. Um, so we did start a grief counseling program. We do one-on-one, -on -one, we do in-home, um, and we do small groups, um, depending on the therapeutic need of the individual. And that's all I have at this time. And uh, again, I can take any questions. Um, our contact information to how to receive services is below. The 222-4257 is a one-stop shop line. Um, any resident can call uh, and will be immediately linked with a resource navigator um, who are well-versed with all services within the county. Excellent, well, thank you so much. This was really really helpful and i think as everybody knows this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart as i work on um, programs and services for older adults in my day job so this is really great and really incredible to see everything that you all are doing at the county level um so we'll ask everybody to use the raise hand function to raise your hand but i always see that keisha has a question so keisha what you got i have a couple questions thanks for your presentation great. Uh, Carissa. So my first question is for the senior citizen centers that have uh, the activities for seniors. I may have missed it, but which one exactly is in District 2? So the, the closest in proximity is our Odenton, our O'Malley Senior Activity Center. And then to the northern, um, to the northern portion of Region 2 will be our Severn Intergenerational Center. So how many miles away is that then for our seniors? That I would have to look at. I feel like that. I've been there before. If and you're the upper, if you're the upper, um, if you're the upper portion of Region Two, Severn Intergenerational Center is very close. Um, if you're in the lower um, uh, eastern part of Region Two, it would be the um, O'Malley Senior. Activity. I'm in Russet, so I I think I'm closer to the O'Malley from what you're describing, mm -hmm. which still is a little ways away because uh, I've been there a couple times. I got you know, tests over there for COVID. Um, and it seems like a nice center, just a little bit further. And so my second question is, how, do you all offer services that would um, pick up seniors and take them to the centers in advance? Okay. So we do not, but the county does. Um, so previous to 2018, um, the senior paratransit system was housed in the Department of Aging and Disabilities. Um, following that year, um, the Office of Transportation was formed, um, and now it's housed um, It's housed there where seniors that can call um, and get a ride to and from their home to a senior activity center. In addition to that, um, you know, post-COVID, um, I hired um, Partners in Care. They're a local nonprofit, um, and once, you know, the, our paratransit gets the person to and from the senior activity center, um, I have trips going out of the Senior Activity Center into the community to pick up medications, to get groceries, to go have a social experience um, so that a senior can know, hey, once a week, I know that I can get somewhere from the Senior Center and back again and then to and from my home. Okay. Um, do we have a lot of assisted living facilities, I guess, within our region also? Uh, actually, comparative um, to the entire county, you have approximately 10 or 11 to the 108 that we have within our county. Primarily, you're going to see those, um, those um, small community-based assisted living in the northern part of the county, in your Glen Burnie, in your Pasadena area, and then again, um, you know, in peppered areas in your Annapolis area. Okay. And then one more question. You were mentioning something about assistive technology and an option to help people learn how to use technology as well as receiving grants. Does that include something like Lifeline for seniors? Would they be able to get assistance for having that installed in their homes if in the event they need that? Yeah, that program um, doesn't, um, doesn't address Lifeline, but if you call the 222-4257 and you're an older adult, um, we will help you okay. with Lifeline. Awesome. That's it. Thanks. Sure. Great questions.
What other questions do we have? Looks like Kevin. All right, Kevin. Good. Our, our, the northern part of our region. I know you. Yeah, probably... I, I just um, I, I think um, those questions were great, by the way, uh, Keisha. And they're kind of dancing around that first question you had, which is, you know, which of these facilities is in region two? The answer is none. None are in region two. We have sure. none. So yeah, the answer the answer is that we don't have that in region two, and so we are putting another um, in close proximity there. But all seniors yeah. have, and there's right the one in Severn is yeah. about the same distance as, as Odenton, so it's still not in region two. Right. Um, you know, and I just I just checked it. I just googled it. It's about 15 minutes from um, from uh, Russet to to Odenton, which isn't too bad, except as we all know, it goes takes you right through. Fort Meade, which certain times of day you just can't drive there. So, because it's so much traffic. So, sure. Yeah. And not every region has a senior activity center, um, but any um, any member of the county can go to any senior activity center. And they are all so different and all offer, you know, um, a wide variety of activities that, you know, in the community, um, you know, you could want to do, you know, a, 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 a crab feast, you know, at Pasadena Senior Activity Center, or do something different in, you know, the Western end, but um, not every region has a senior activity center. Yeah, and it's nicer to do these things with your neighbors and, and you know, people in your community rather than going to a different community. And yeah, you know, there's Pasadena and there's Annapolis and there's you know they're all crowded together over there and this is one of the many reasons why those of us in West County feel left out so yeah 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 I, I agree Kevin I think you know that you know I guess that's my question is you know what you know why why isn't there especially I think now as we're thinking about once again the next 20 years and you're one slide about by 2030 we're going to see oh my gosh it looked like almost a 50 percent increase in older adults which is fantastic so, you know, what, what do you see, you know, you know, sh you know, what can we do to advocate for these plans to have more resources and possibly a senior center in the western part of the county besides just the new Severn one, which is going to be great. But I think with the growth, we probably should have more. Sure, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and looking at, uh, you know, capital planning, um, I, I first needed to address the expanding growth within the senior centers. Um, so in looking at, um, you know, my capital budget request, I had to look at expanding um, current centers uh, that were busting at the seams. Um, and, you know, definitely it's meetings like these. It's listening to the community members. Um, it's looking at how many participants I have from Region 2 that are attending O'Malley. Uh, is there a higher concentration from the West End of Region, you know, too? Do I need to look at that participation? I would look at, you know, uh, planning based on who is 45 to 55 right now in that area. Um, mm -hmm. And in 10 years, what do I need to have available and how close does it need to be? So I consider all of those factors when I make a capital request. Yeah. And, you know, not to put Mark Thompson on the spot, but I'm just thinking, you know, we know that there's an older population over in Maryland City and there's a lot of retirees and the rest of it, you know, and it's like you have this beautiful race course and there's lots of land, you know, is there a way that you could have a partnership with, you know, and have some programming in some of these other locations just so that way people aren't having to travel as far because I think as Alexis has pointed out earlier, transportation is an issue. And I think that, you know, well, once again, Odenton on a map isn't that far, it can be, you know, it can be a different, and I, and, you know, that's the hard part. I mean, we would love the, I'm sure you would love the data of these are the amount of older adults that aren't coming to Odenton because they can't get there. I, I know you don't know that, know that, but I mean, I think we can safely assume there are people who aren't being reached in the Jessup area, um, the Hanover area over in Maryland City and probably would really benefit from some of these programs. Even though you guys, it's, it's great all the things you're doing in the community. I'm not you know, your congregate meal programs, your Meals on Wheels, that's awesome. But I still think that as we just see this incredible growth of older adults, we're all going to be living older, right? We're all aging in place much better now, which is fantastic. Um, and I think we we want to make sure that we all can age in place and have a great quality of life. And I think that's something we should really invest in in Anne Arundel County 
um, as we look forward into our plans for the next 20 years. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, in the past 10 years um, through this administration in the past has been the first investment uh, in senior activity centers since I want to say the 80s. Um, yeah. So um, it's great that I could have during the past 10 years um, four projects, um, you know, on the books for my capital budget um, and they were honored. Um, so I definitely see forecasting forward um, that there's some latitude for, for this population in, in all communities. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't want to take up. I, I could talk about this all day. So, um, well, I just have one other just piece. I just want to just state out loud and just, Chris, is, you're going to agree with me. So don't worry. It's going to be more of just a statement. But yeah, I think it's just really important that we as a, as a SAC realize as well that as we, we there there are a tremendous amount of older adults that are also low income and and there are a ton of people that are paying more than half their income in rent or other you know housing costs and they're older adults and, and the highest and the quickest I'm sorry the 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 fastest growing segment of homeless people in America are people over the age of 65 so we are seeing older adults who are either living in temporary situations, transitional housing, or even in vehicles or other, or hotels or other places, because the places where they live, they're just completely being boxed out. And there are ways that we can smartly change our zoning or that we can hopefully get the federal government to step in through either the HUD 202 programs or the HUD Section 8 that can really bring in affordable senior housing communities. Because um, I know at Leading Age, where I work, we represent uh, nonprofit affordable senior housing communities, and we do not have one in Region Two. Where there, there is, you know, great affordable. You know, um, Catholic Charities has some great affordable senior housing Section Two Hundred Two homes in the Odenton area. But you know, there's also probably some great places that we could probably think about that. So there's ways that we as a county could think about not only the middle market or even low income, but also really low income because in order to be eligible for a section 202 voucher through the HUD program, your income has to be less than $13,000 a year. So these are low income seniors living off of $13,000 or less who are able to get vouchers. And right now there's only enough vouchers to support 30% of those who are eligible. So we know for a fact that there are 70% of older adults that make 13,000 or less that aren't able to get access to affordable housing because it just doesn't exist. So I think we as a community, as we think about the great place that this is to live, we can think about creative ways to also house those that are older uh, and are low income and give them a safe place to live. You were right. I'm in agreement and I second <laughs> that. And, and that is a huge issue. So, that right. is a huge issue. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, I think if we don't have any other questions. Um, why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break and then we're going to come back for our Department of uh, Recreation and Parks. Does that work, Mark? Perfect. Yep. Okay, great. So we'll come back at 7.16. Right. Everybody get a glass of water take a break. Thanks. Join us here this evening. Uh, on, on behalf of Director Lays and all of us at Department of Recreation and Parks, we're, we're happy to be invited and be part of your planning process. I, I want to quickly give you an overview of the Department of Recreation and Parks. Uh, some people aren't familiar with the, the breadth of things that, that we're involved in. Uh, and then I want to talk about our planning process and how it dovetails into the to Plan 2040 and the development of these region plans. To start off with, very simply, our mission is to create opportunities to enjoy life, to explore nature, and restore health and well-being. And, and that last part of our mission statement is why I'm here this evening. Uh, by the numbers, the uh, Anne Arundel County Park System, there's more than 12,800 acres of parkland. Uh, we have more than 160 parks, 164 actually, uh, more than 200 miles of trails, and more than 1,700 park amenities. And a park amenity can be a tennis court or a baseball field or a picnic shelter, uh, all of the things that you find out in our parks. Our, our parks are very popular. Uh, in, in eight months that ended uh, this winter, we had 2.1 million park visitors. Uh, 
And uh, last fiscal year, we had nearly 1.5 million people walk on the our trail system. The, those numbers are down a little bit, surprisingly. They're, they're record numbers still for us, but uh, the pandemic sent everybody outside and into our parks. So we had, we had record park visitation at the height of uh, the pandemic. Some of the things that, that and the popularity of, of our uh, facilities, we, we, have, uh, we have more than 300,000 swimmers a year that utilize our two aquatic centers. We host more than 100,000 golfers at our two golf courses and more than 30,000 skaters at our two outdoor ice rinks. Our, our recreation programs, last year as we were coming out of COVID, there were 275 different programs. This year, we're up to 364 recreation programs and over 5,000 people participating in those programs. Uh, a lot of people know us through our youth sports programs. We have a lot of adult sports programs. Uh, it, it would be an understatement to tell you how many thousands of, of adults and children in the county participate in our, our sports programs. Uh, just in the month of June, we, we run three very popular lacrosse uh, tournaments. And we have 300, this year we had 316 teams, which is about five to 6,000 lacrosse players, not counting their parents and other spectators and officials. Uh, so uh, a lot of people involved. And right now we're in the midst of, of running 28 different summer sports camps. Um, I know we talked earlier in, in the, the presentations about childcare. That's a unique part of the mission of the Department of Recreation and Parks is that we operate school-age child care centers in 46 locations around the county, and we average uh, just over 2,600 kids per day being served by those child care centers. Here at the department, there's, there's more than 750 of us but we're lean and mean because fewer than 200 of us are, are full time. Most of our employees are temporary and seasonal workers. They're, they're lifeguards and, and summer rangers, uh, uh, camp attendants and recreation specialists. And we're always looking for a few good people. We need just about uh, every job description that we have in our department. So like everybody else out there today, we're hiring. Part of the reason we're hiring is County Council has blessed us with a robust operating budget this year, just shy of $40 million. But more impressive than that is our capital projects budget. That, that's, of course, the part of the Rec and Parks operation that I'm involved in. But at $99.7 million, that is up $40 million over last year and is almost equal to FY20 20 and 21 combined. So record expenditure in park and recs facilities. Very quickly, our, our, our department is organized, uh, not surprisingly, into recreation and parks. Think of recreation as people and the programs that we offer, whether it's sports leagues, our adaptive recreation program, the various programs that are run through our uh, community recreation centers or through our specialized facilities and our child care program comes under recreation as well. Parks is more about places and lands and things, whether it's, it's natural or cultural resources, agricultural lands, or our parks, our trails, our water access points, and, and how we take care of all of that. The best place to learn about our recreation programs is to pick up one of our Explore magazines. This is the new one, it's just being distributed. It may not be at your library or senior center today, it should be there tomorrow. Uh, this magazine lists all of the program offerings, all of the classes, all of the sports leagues that are available for the fall season. Uh, you can take a look at that. 
it is it is amazing to see the kinds of things there are there are literally hundreds of dance classes yoga classes uh, you, you can come to our programs and, and learn everything from ceramics to self-defense. When we talk about our physical facilities, and I'll come back to talk about this later, since we are land-based, we are interested in things and open spaces, the federal government owns most of this planning region. So when you carve out Fort Meade and the Eastern Ecological Research Center, which most of us around here still call the Patuxent Natural Resource Center, uh, it, it leaves a very small swath of land west of the parkway and north of Route 32, for the most part, that aren't federal lands. And so we try and focus on the communities that are spread through there from Maryland City at the south end, up through Laurel and into uh, Annapolis Junction, Jessup, Dorsey, uh, and into the into the Harmons area. Let's talk about our, our planning and, and more specifically our, our land preservation parks and recreation plan. 2022, as, as you've probably been introduced to by our, my colleagues from OPZ, 2022 has been the year of, of the plan in, in Anne Arundel County. Uh, we went into the year with the, with the freshly adopted Plan 2040. Earlier this year, the new green infrastructure plan was adopted. And uh, just last month, the County Council adopted the latest version of our land preservation parks and recreation plan. We do this plan a little bit more frequently than the other plans in the county. We are required by the state to do this every five years. So this is a, this is a dynamic plan for us. Uh, we, we literally have just put this one to bid, but we've started identifying the things that we need when we do our 2027 update to the plan. And, and let me take you through the methodology associated with developing this plan. The, there are three key steps as, as we develop this plan. The, the first step is we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to measure what it is that we already have. We're looking at the supply and inventory of our parks, of our lands, of those, those different amenities within the parks. We need a physical count so that we're sure what we have. We compare ourselves to national standards. We, we look at the number of tennis courts per thousand population. We look at uh, just recreational land available in the population. Uh, so we, we compare ourselves with what those standards are and what we see in park and recreation systems similar in size to Anne Arundel County. We take a look at the demographics that we've talked about already this evening, where people are and how people, how old people are. We are especially interested in those under 17 and those over 65. We, we go back and look at our park visitation records uh, we, we, we count the number of adults and children that participate in our various sports and recreation programs, and all that factors into how busy we are. We, we review other plans, not just the, the general development plan, but we, we will go back and look at, although they were very dated for this go-round, we, we looked at 20-year-old small area plans from various parts of the county just to see what the input was there. And, and that would factor into the determination of what we need in Anne Arundel County. All of that data collection, counting people and, and counting swing sets, all gets, all gets consolidated in two important analyses. And, and I'll go into these in, in more detail, but we do a, a proximity analysis which tells us in, in gross terms, if we have parks in amenities in the right parts of the county, where people are and where those facilities are needed. 
And then there has been an emphasis now on doing an equity analysis. And so this year we, we were able to make use through the Department of Natural Resources. The University of Maryland has developed uh, a, a program called Cleverly, the Park Equity Analysis Tool. And so our data gets plugged into that and it helps us analyze equity issues. And then finally, after all that counting and all that analysis, we have to sit down to develop a plan to meet those needs, whether they were needs that were developed uh, because people told us about it or we measured a deficiency or one of the more sophisticated analyses of either proximity or location has told us we need to we need to build some new facilities or we need to add things to our recreation and park system. And so the we put forth a plan that is is based on in, in three large areas. We look at, at things we need to acquire. We look at facility development where we already have land or we have existing parks, but we need to add amenities, we need to add new features. And then finally, with over 160 parks, a lot of them are older parks, facility rehabilitation is an important part of our planning. Well, let me go into a couple of, of details there. In region two, and, and I'm gonna stumble around the maps a little bit because our planning is done based on council districts, not, not the, these new regions. So I've, I've been able to translate most of that information, but in, in region two, again, owing to the fact that, that there is so much land that is consumed by the federal government, we, we have just a, a, a handful, 10 county parks and a dozen school parks uh, that, that provide the areas that we need. But based on the land area that's available, uh, we're actually okay. In fact, it's interesting because of all the federal lands, Council District 4, which is a large part of, of this planning region, Council District 4 has the highest area in the county in terms of recreation area per, per thousand people. I think it's 150 plus acres per person uh, in, in that council district, which is, is mainly this planning district. So there's the, it appears to be that there's lots of space available it's not too crowded in this region. We, we check out well when we compare ourselves to national standards for looking at, at things like amount of land and, and, and amenities. And we're okay with, with, we're on the same goals, same track as the, the older small area plans that were, were impacting this area. Probably the most important part of determining in our, our needs is listening to what people tell us. We did uh, nine community meetings around the county. Uh, unfortunately, we had to do them virtually. Uh, we set up our own uh, email address. Uh, we, we provided ways for people to provide input. When we, when we got to a paper document with the help from the library system and, and the Office of Aging Disabilities, we put hard copies of our draft plan in 33 locations around the county, in, in every branch library, in the senior centers, in, in all of our staff facilities. And, and these are the kinds of things we heard in the, uh, in, in the council districts that are impacted by region two. We, we heard a, ne a need for more soccer fields and more turf fields. Uh, people told us that they wanted more natural and green spaces. They, there's lots of green space uh, in, in the Patuxent Wildlife Refuge, but not all of it is accessible. Um, tying right in with, with the earlier presentation, we heard requests for senior activities, more, more activities for our aging population. We heard a call for indoor pools. Uh, this side of the county doesn't have the water access obviously that the eastern part of the county uh, enjoys. So there was interest in, in swimming pools. Uh, people want more gymnastics and dance, more indoor type recreation uh, activities. We also have a request for, for more dog parks in this area. Um, and we, again, relating to 
community use and, and people gathering spaces, more, more, we had a request for more picnic, picnic areas and, and pavilions. So th those were the needs that, that we looked at. When, when we get into the proximity analysis, we, we look at things on a half mile and a five mile catchment area. Basically, we set up a buffer around each of our parks or particular amenities. Uh, the, the map that you're looking at on the left is the overall proximity analysis. Uh, we can see a couple, our, our problems here are areas of white that aren't water. That, that's, a, that's a land area where we don't necessarily have people close to the activities or the park amenities. Sometimes those are, are unduly influenced by our athletic field complexes. We, we tend to build facilities like up at Matthewstown Harmon Park and, and at Provinces Park where we, we will have two, three, four multi-purpose fields, baseball diamonds, whatever, kind of grouped together. And so those are more regionalized areas and, and those sometimes cause uh, some of these white spaces we see on our map. Generally, the county is okay in terms of, of proximity. We, we have facilities where we have people or they are within five miles of those facilities which is, is the, the baseline for measuring proximity. When we get into the equity analysis, unfortunately, it's a little easier to find region two because the red and orange and yellow are the areas of high, medium, high, and medium need. And, and these are based on scores that came out of the park equity tool that I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the scoring here told us that the areas north of Fort Meade and south of Severn are the areas of greatest need when it comes to equity. And, and, and some of the inputs to that, that park equity tool that, that the UM developed, they, that tool looks at population density it looks at the poverty level, it looks at the age and race, and it looks at, uh, already talked about this evening, the walkability score and access to public transit. Because sometimes, as, as was true with senior centers, sometimes we have parks that people simply can't get to for one reason or another. The, the interesting thing is, I think all three agencies that you're hearing from this evening uh, have a uh, our stakeholders in the Severn Intergenerational Center, which be because my colleagues from OPZ drew the line wrong is just outside of Region Two, but it's obviously going to impact and and benefit this region as much as as uh, any other neighboring or joining regions. That Severn Intergenerational Center will have health programs as well as. Uh, we're going to be offering recreation programs, programming there in partnership with the Boys and Girls Club. The areas in orange where we see medium high need or the yellow areas where there's medium need, those are, are most impacted because of walkability and public transit. You, you can't get from one place to another. The parks that we have, are where the people are, but the, those areas around the fort, uh, they get influenced unduly by that walkability score. So again, those are the kinds of things that, that go into developing our plan. So let's talk about our plan and how we respond to those needs. If the biggest thing we need in this region is, is land. This is probably the greatest area in the county in which we have real acquisition needs. We, we, we listen to what folks said and they want more passive recreation. They, they want more open green space. They want dog parks. They want more multi-purpose fields. And so these are the projects that are in our capital plan 
uh, going to Jessup Elementary School and, and expanding the trails that lead to and from that to expand some passive recreation opportunities. We, we have been trying for a number of years to purchase parcels of land adjacent to Jessup Park. We would love to expand that park. And as soon as we have the land, we're going to do that. We, we, we heard people ask for more dance classes, more senior activities, a lot of yoga and, and seated aerobics type things. We need an indoor recreation center. Uh, we just opened the Deep Run Community Center and Community Recreation Center, uh, which is a repurposed building up just south of, of Maryland 100 uh, by Coca-Cola Drive. Uh, again, it's, it's just out of this planning region, but it, it is one of the few indoor recreation centers that we have on the, the west side of the county. So hopefully we can find an appropriate site and begin design and construction of a rec center in the Maryland City area. We, we would love to find a, a 50 acre parcel where we can construct a new athletic complex. We're, we're, we're going around and adding turf fields and trying to wedge in soccer fields and ball diamonds uh, in existing parks, but we really need to create a, a Western athletic complex uh, very similar to what we have, uh, say, down at Riva Park in the South Central Park of the county, where, where we can have two or three baseball fields and, and two or three multi-purpose fields for, for soccer, lacrosse, football, whatever, in, in the same place. We, we also are looking for land for a smaller community park. Uh, our community parks aren't loaded up with soccer fields. Our community parks get things like picnic shelters and walking paths. And uh, we're getting a lot of requests for more pollinator gardens, uh, more passive activities. Uh, uh, we're, we're actually designing the, the first meditation garden uh, that's going to be in Anne Arundel County and in, in the northern part of the county. Those are the kinds of things that we're hearing people ask for and, and we're trying to plan for. We, we have a whole series of, of countywide needs. Uh, we're looking for a place to build an indoor tennis center. We're looking for a place to build a water park. Uh, we're, we're, looking, we're looking for land to build an indoor sports facility. Uh, a, a field house, if you will, that could hold uh, a soccer field inside a building. And, and we're always looking for greenways and open space to add to our system. And I, I'll talk more about, about green spaces and, and Rec and Park's interest in that. In our facility rehabilitation uh, planning, it, within this region, a, a couple of projects that jump out, we, we look at facility irrigation. Uh, we look at irrigation and lighting to expand our ability to use the fields that we do have. If, if we can't find real estate to build a new soccer field, we can take an old soccer field, put Bermuda turf on it with irrigation and put lights up and, and get 30% more use out of it in a typical week. So we look at, at sites where we can make those kinds of improvements to get more use out of the facilities that we have. Our, our capital plan includes adding some irrigation that on the field over at Brockbridge Elementary School and one of the fields up at Matthews Town Harmons Park. We're also looking at, at adding some lighting up there in, at Matthews Town Harmon on one of the fields and, and resurfacing the trails at, at Jessup Park but probably, the, and I'll come back to this, included in that facility rehabilitation, a big piece of our effort there is on bringing our facilities into full compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. I, I mentioned very briefly land preservation. We are always interested in land, whether it's agricultural land that we're trying to preserve and protect, whether it's natural resource land that we want to keep green and open and part of our county green infrastructure, 
So this slide here simply, although there's, there's almost no agricultural land west of the dairy farm, uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities out there. And so we're always looking to add farmland to our almost 14,000 acres of protected agricultural land. Same is true on natural resources conservation. Recreation and parks is, is, a, is a key partner with the Office of Planning and Zoning in identifying and exploiting and preserving uh, natural resource lands. What, what the green infrastructure plan refers to as green hubs and corridors, we call parks and trails. So it's a, it's a natural partnership. There's almost 50,000 acres of natural resource land in Anne Arundel County that are currently protected, either through outright ownership. Uh, we, we, we evaluate at Reckon Parks an average of probably six to 10 properties every month to purchase uh, or receive into our system. Sometimes people bequeath land when they pass away. Uh, not every parcel of land that Reckon Parks owns has a playground on it. We, we are fine with taking land and simply protecting it because we recognize the value of those green spaces. I mentioned the ADA compliance, and, and that's an, a very important uh, task within Rec and Parks. Um, to be quite honest, we, we had not done a very good job. Uh, the director recognized that uh, in, in 2020, we hired a consultant to begin an assessment. Uh, just like our planning, we needed to start with figuring out what we had and, and what those problems were. Uh, that, that, uh, that assessment uh, lasted until into the beginning part of last year. And then with those findings in hand, we, we've started to, to tackle that challenge. Whenever we plan a new park, we, we plan our parks to be fully accessible. That means we're doing things a little bit differently. We're, we're emphasizing adding some playground equipment that you may not find in our older parks, but now you're, you're seeing uh, swings and uh, merry-go-round devices that, uh, that will, will actually accommodate a wheelchair. We, we're changing our swing sets so that instead of just that, that hard wooden seat that was in old parks or the more contemporary rubber sling seat, we, we actually have uh, seats that will accommodate physically challenged children uh, so that they can enjoy our parks. Uh, whenever we do a major park improvement project, if we're there to add a baseball field, for example, we are also addressing the areas around that. So we, we take that opportunity when we go into the park to correct curb issues. There may not be a path that leads to every field in the park. So we're adding handicapped accessible uh, paths and, and we're going into the, the bathroom buildings that exist in, in many of our parks, making sure that those are, are ADA accessible. We have a standalone capital project and that, that's important because it, it tells you that the county council is, is an important partner on all of this. They have funded uh, a, a multi-million dollar, multi-year capital project to help us catch up with, with all of these deficiencies. Uh, our park renovation and maintenance people are every day addressing the thousands of deficiencies that we have identified and, and slowly but surely we're getting them knocked out. And then our adaptive recreation program continues to expand. And so we need the facilities to support that we're, we're adding our second adaptive baseball field up, up in the northern part of the county. We're adding uh, in the coming year a power chair a hockey rink at our adaptive recreation complex at, at Lake Waterford Park. And the county and the city of Annapolis are partners on the adaptive boating center that is being developed by 
Chesapeake Regional Accessible Boating uh, in a repurposed marina over on, on Bemby Creek. So I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the ADA. I thought that was important, our efforts there. Uh, that was a very quick overview, uh, and I'm here to take any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Really appreciate that. So definitely we'll dive right into questions. Um, so folks want to raise their hands, get my attention. Anyway. Um, well, while folks are thinking, I will. Oh, uh, April, go ahead. So the Jessup Province's field is like the only place that we have to go in Region 2 for a, that's the only large park and it's being turned over to Arundel High School area students and the, the Jessup area students are not able to use those fields um, because they've been reallocated away from. So the feeder system is not going to have any good athletes coming through through because they're all um, to go to Fort Meade High School. And then there's, in, I think that we're the only place that doesn't have a lighted field. Then Provinces Park could have a lighted field, but there's never been one put in. And when you're talking about the Severn Inner um, Generational Center, who do you mean by the Boys and Girls Club? Because there's several Boys and Girls Club in Region 2. Um, anyway, I have more questions, but my dogs are barking, so I'll stop. Well, l l let me see if I, if I can address those. The, we, we provide the facilities, most of the soccer programs, I, were you, I'm not sure if you were asking about soccer or football, those are our, our partner community-based youth organizations, uh, JPYO uh, or Arundel Soccer uh, in this region. Uh, those are the people that operate the soccer leagues and, and uh, little leagues and, and things like that. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, I'm not sure the correlation between the, them and the high school athletics programs. Uh, uh, there are there are kids that that may play in the in in ASA and end up playing anywhere uh, in Anne Arundel County. But uh, what high school they go to is determined by their place of residence. So so I'm not, I'm not sure that that that's something that Rec and Parks re really has control over. Uh, the the Lighted athletic field you mentioned, we, we recognize that. That's why uh, that's why Matthewstown Harmons is is on there to, to receive lights on the field up there, so that we can extend that use. Uh, that's certainly why we're looking to construct a West County athletic complex. The those are, as I said, multi field complexes, uh, usually three or four lighted fields. Uh, we're in the process of, of a major improvement project, and I know it's, it's just outside of this region, but the, the Gamble Zodenton Recreation Council Park over in Odenton, uh, that's a good example. We're, we're about to add, uh, we're in the midst of a, of a $6 million construction project where we're, we are adding four lighted baseball fields, and we're putting lights on, on two multi-purpose fields. Those are the kinds of things we, we look for. The most important thing is, though, it, here we, we need the land for the park. If, if, if that land was out there, and, and I'll talk a little bit about land acquisition here in a second, if, if we can find the land, we'll develop those facilities. We, we, we have heard loud and clear the, the kinds of, of needs that, that you described. Uh, one thing about Provinces Park, I'll mention, and, and again, I think it's across the street from the line that separates uh, this region from, from the adjacent one. Uh, Provinces Park has been selected for the location of the West County Swim Center. So in the coming years, we're going to be building an approximately $50 million indoor swim center there. 
that will address the demand for indoor pools that we heard from the, the western side of Anne Arundel County. And I'm not sure if I could, did I, did I cover all your questions there? Um, I think so, except for you mentioned all the boys and girls clubs, but are you actually talking to people from each one, like JPYO? Have you spoken to somebody, like you're saying that they're, that you're, they're partners, the boys and girls clubs are going to be partners of the intergenerational center. Is something started yet for that? Well, it, the, the center is under construction, and there is a there is a steering committee. Uh, uh, Arundel Development Corporation is actually the lead agency in developing that facility, and I know that they have a monthly meeting uh, that includes. I know because our recreation people are part of it, along with representatives from Boys and Girls Club, uh, the health department. Uh, I think DOAD is in those meetings as well. There are, there are a whole bunch of agencies that are involved in, in helping to develop that center. And so that, that's kind of a model for the rest of the county. We expect to see more of that. So why don't you use the YMCA building next to the, the property with the YMCA building next to Jessup Elementary School for recreational purposes? It used to be a child care center then it was an office for construction of the new um, elementary school, and now it's sitting there empty again. And it would be a great place for a little community center. And that's right next to Jessup Elementary, you say? Yes. I, I, we don't use it because it's not ours, is, is the short answer. But I, you, you now have my interest. If it's, do you know if it's for sale or if it's available? The, the county does own it, so it's definitely owned by the county. Okay, then, then I would suspect that, that some agency must be reserving it for something. I, I mentioned the new Deep Run Recreation Center uh, up uh, just off of Coca-Cola Drive. That, that building, uh, the County Central Services Department uh, earlier this year sent out a notice to all county agencies and said, Hey, we have this building sitting here. It's going to be empty. The police department had used it for a while. There was a, a nonprofit organization that used it for a while, but it, it became available. So Rec and Parks uh, swooped in and said, we'll take it. And, and we've been uh, working to renovate it and open it and start to offer recreation and after school programs there. So if, if, if a building similar to that is available anyplace else, we're, we're definitely interested. Our, our, the County Department of Central Services is the county's landlord, and, and they tell us about those opportunities when they're from other agencies. Within Rec and Parks, uh, I'll share with you that we have started a, a significant study looking at what we call unused and underutilized parks. Uh, we are in the process of identifying areas around the county where we already own the land and we either haven't developed it at all or we have only developed a portion of it. And for one reason or another, a portion of that, that property is still sitting there available. So we're assessing where those properties are, having some engineers take a look at it and say, hey, we need dog parks, soccer fields, indoor recreation centers, will any of them fit on these parcels of land that we already own? So, so that's an important part of, of what we're involved in now. Thank you very much. Sure. Great. So it looks like we have the first uh, set of questions from Jim. Hey, Jim. Good on, Joe. And thanks for the presentation. I did have one question um, specifically related to the Patuxent Wildlife Refuge, since it is such a large component um, of Region 2. I was just curious what relationship, if any, the county maintains with the refuge, because it seems like there could be just, you know, on the surface, maybe some opportunity to partner together since that's such a large asset to Region 2. I, I, I'm aware that in our, our natural resources people, uh, 
which includes uh, the, the superintendents and the biologists and the rangers that, that manage uh, our Jung, Judd Bay Wetlands Sanctuary and Beverly Triton Nature Park and Bacon Ridge Natural Area uh, do consult with uh, and interface with the, the, the fish and wildlife people that are, that are there at Patuxent. We do not, to the best of my knowledge, have active programming. Uh, we, we don't take people into the federal lands there. It's, it's probably an area that we should look at exploiting. Uh, and and make better use of that if to the extent that the federal government will will welcome us in there I had some experiences with them lately and it sounds like they're obviously experiencing a little bit of a bump in attendance with folks um through covid and such but i, I think that they are sort of like rebranding themselves a little bit to open their gates more and and step away from just being a research facility and more highlight some of the amenities they have, whether it's parks or the trails or fishing and hiking and biking and such. So anyway, just an observation. Thanks. No, you know, I, I, I share your observation. The rebranding, they changed the name. They have, uh, they have eliminated some of the socially objectionable activities, uh, research activities that, that were conducted there. And, and yeah, like, just like we did in response to the pandemic, that they opened their doors, uh, which was important. That's great. Thanks, Jim, great question. Keisha? Yeah, my question refers to the equity study that you guys did. And I saw that you had that one area in our district that had, uh, or like region that we had like uh, red. Yes. A very red area. What, what exactly are the plans in order to satisfy that area and have some sort of like a park facility for our neighbors over there well th that is that is a tough area uh and that's the reason that 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 intergenerational center is is being constructed there uh there there is one large park there at, at mead village uh, uh unfortunately it's not the safest park in, in our system we would like to add other park facilities in that area. Uh, we're kind of back to the land question. We, we do make use of, of the fields at Van Bothlin Elementary School and, and, and the other schools within this region. Um, but we've, we've got an interesting problem that's developing now as they change the school schedule. The schools are going to be, the school day is going to run later. And that means that after school activities like sports teams practicing, will run later into the evening. So we've had to shift our recreation programs back to match the school system schedule. And so that impacts our ability to make use of some of the, if, if you remember, I said we had there are 12 school parks uh, compared to just 10 county parks in this region. And so we rely on scheduling soccer teams to use Brockbridge Elementary fields or, or uh, examples like that. So we, we need to address that. The first thing we had to do was, was get that map made to tell us where the problems are. And, and we said, hey, we need to get busy in the, in the Severn, Mead Village, Pioneer City areas up there. Great, all right. And uh, Kevin, I see you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up on what April was saying about uh, the facilities at, uh, near the Jessup Elementary School. Um, and it's actually at the new entrance to the school um, and, and on Route 175. And actually, my daughter went to uh, daycare at the YMCA that was there years yeah. ago. Uh, and uh, Mark and Carrie, you guys were going to research. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, the Board of Education owns that land. Did you ever find out an answer? Okay. What I'm what I'm looking at here is it is all one large parcel. So everything from Jessup Road to the, the open field in the back, and then all the forested land along Champion Forest Avenue is all part of um, one parcel on its board of education. In including the corner of the new entrance road, I forget what that's called. And yeah. Okay, and yeah. so I don't understand why the maps consistently show that wrong. 
I mean, if you just, you know, the, uh, the, the map that you just showed us, Bruce, it shows part of that parcel as being owned by the uh, Board of Education. And there's actually a much larger parcel, including that building that's now rotting. Um, it, it's owned by the Board of Education and maybe you don't play nice with Parks and Rec, but it would be nice if they got together. Hey, I, I can't speak. I'm this is the one that you're talking about, Kevin. Yeah, uh, but actually, if you go over, you know, down and to the right from there. Um, the triangular piece? No, no, no. Uh, I, I'm talking all the way down by Red Bud Avenue. If, if, yeah, I think that, um, right. Right there at the corner of Red Bud and 175 on the left, that's the church and that's the building in question. And it's my understanding that those four lots that you just highlighted, or maybe even eight lots, are owned by the Board of Education. So it's showing up as Anne Arundel County, whereas that would come up as Board of Ed. So Right. So those are also owned by the county. And yet it's only, it's never admitted that that's owned by the county. For some reason, the county is ignoring those parcels. And if it, and, and again, if you go back to Bruce's uh, map, it's an upside down L, not not a, not a horseshoe shape. Well, and and I I will tell you that our maps that that wasn't a map of Board of Education facilities. That was the part that was a map of of our recreation areas. Right, but you showed both. So so yeah. we, but on a particular school site, we may not even show the entire school site. Okay. We, we may only show the playing fields that we have an agreement with the board to use, and and we and and we continue. Don't don't read that there's any bad blood between the the school system and Rec and Parks. Uh, we we work together. In fact, we're 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 working on a couple of sites. Uh, we're we're taking a little bit different approach. We we've tried to share some sites, and we we've done that effectively where we utilize the fields. Uh, we're, we're actually now looking at some sites where we are going to develop park facilities ahead of the demand for the school facility. And knowing that, uh, we, for example, there's, there's one site in North County, we're, we're going to build uh, two soccer fields on that parcel, but eventually we will lose one of those fields to the school that will need to be constructed there, according to the board's uh, calculations. So, so we're, we're involved in their planning process and, and they and ours, you'll, you'll see if you look at the full LPPRP, the, the Land Preservation Parks and Recreation Plan, uh, you, you'll see the, the school's capital program laid out in there. Uh, you know, they, they've interrupted us because they're building Old Mill High School West uh, so we, they've, we, we're, we had to reschedule uh, programs that we were using those fields for to accommodate the construction. And when the construction is complete, there'll be new fields that we'll then have access to. So we, we have a good relationship. I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in, and uh, t tomorrow I'm going to learn more about those uh, parcels of land you just highlighted. Yeah, there's, there's eight parcels. Um, right, right. And, and also to, to highlight something else that April said is that, you know, th that part of Jessup is not shown as a, as a park desert. Oh, it's easy access because you can get to Jessup Park and you can get to uh, Dorsey Jessup Park. Right. But those are so small, they're practically worthless. There's one field on the one park and there's a couple basketball courts and tennis courts on the other. That's it. And so I think, you know, acquiring more land for Jessup Park should be at the top of your priority list because it's, it's just, I, I know you talked about um, how there's a lot of parks in uh, Council District 4, but we're in Council District 1. Right. In fact, in fact I, I disagree with you. I think most of the non-Fort Meade part of, of, of our, you know, our Area 2 is actually in Council District 1. Uh, and, you know, there's, it's just, just not being well served by the Parks Department. Bruce, you may want to reach out to the Department of Public Works uh, in regards to a few of those eight parcels along Redbud because they're, um, I believe they're expanding part of that section of the road and then some to the east along Champion Forest as part of a capital project. Yeah, they they're, not gonna, they're not going to need all eight, but 
I right, right. At least uh, the the front and the rear. I suspect that some agency has those parcels reserved for some future. It, it might be utilities. I, I don't know. We've been asking about it for 20, 30 years now, and nothing happens. Yeah. Our, uh, our five-year uh, land preservation parks and recreation plan, the 2017 version of that plan had the acquisition of land to expand Jessup Park yeah. And it's repeated again here five years later. So, so that need has been there. There was there was one parcel of the land that I know we were negotiating with the owner trying to secure. That did not happen. Uh, unfortunately, they're just not making as much land as they used to. So it's it's becoming increasingly difficult for us. Well, yeah, except in Hawaii, they're still making new land in Hawaii. Yeah, exactly. but, um, but yeah, good luck with that. And if you could look into those eight parcels and do something with that building, don't let it just rot. So thank you. Thank you. Well, Greg, Bruce, I think we're, don't have any questions from anybody else, but I just, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask specifically, we did a driving tour, I think I remarked about that earlier, where we drove around uh, uh, region two. And um, one area that that a lot of us are care about and have actually worked on is the Oxbow Nature Preserve and wanted to know what the plans were for that. I know the Russet Community Association back when I was on the board in like 2009, 2010, they had put about $30,000 in escrow to pay for a possible platform and a viewing area. I think that those funds that, that I, for, for whatever reason, I don't remember why that didn't happen, but I just wanted to know what plans are there for the Oxbow Nature nature preview area is there looking to be any anything any improvements done there we we have we have no plans for for that that area okay great all right well with that i think those are all the questions we have so um thanks to all okay. of our county, county mr presenters. franco if i can before you wrap up oh sure yeah of course yeah no problem just just two things i'd ask you to consider as as you continue working on this and strategies uh, for for planning it is you all here tonight are the most important part. We need we need more public participation. We, we we like to listen to people tell us what they need in their communities. Unfortunately, we don't get the kind of participation we'd like. Uh, we went through this this year and a half long process trying to reach out to, to get people to tell us what do you want where you live and play uh, while our our. For example, our survey, we had 20% more people participate uh, this time around than we did five years ago. Uh, we still had fewer than 3,000 people out of almost 600,000 in the county. So, so we need public participation. We need people involved in the process and, and telling us what the needs are out in the community. And, and the second thing, if I didn't say it already, we need land. If, if, if you know open spaces like these eight parcels we were just talking about, Please let us know. Let your council person know. Uh, feedback through the Office of Planning and Zoning. Uh, we, we need to expand our park system, especially in that, so that when the next generation drives around Region 2, they'll say, wow, look at all these parks. You can hardly go down the street without running into a park. Yeah, that's great. And I, I'm surprised you didn't mention pickleball. That was the one thing I was surprised. You didn't mention pickleball. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to come up. So uh, I'm sure pickleball courts everywhere. Yeah, that, so. it is. It is. All right, great. Thank well, you perfect. again. Well, yes, thank you. All right, well, I know we're running a little over, but Mark, do you want to just kind of give uh, just kind of a quick piece about um, what we have upcoming? I see you have your housing prioritization here. Yep, exactly. So let me let me run through these really quickly. Um, most of this is also up online, so I'll just direct folks to that. So again, following up on um, our meeting last month, where we we put up those dots on the recommendations from Plan 2040. Um, again, just wanted to highlight that the largest vote getter was changing zoning and development regulations to allow a variety of housing forms and densities so long as that product is com uh, compatible with the rest of the neighborhood. Um, and you see some of those other than that were, um, that also received about four or five votes and we're sort of in that middle tier as well. So again, this exercise, this is gonna help Carrie and I focus in on specific recommendations then as we're writing the plan. Um, 
Then for the feedback summary, so we've got two things up for the feedback summary. We have this, this great dashboard that our research and GIS team had put together um, where you can look through each individual comment. You can see where that comment was left actually on the map. Um, we've got some other statistics up here um, on that dashboard as well. Um, and again, that's, that's at that website there at the bottom of the page. Um, we have also put up the, let me go back to this one real quick. So we've also put up a summary of the results. But again, if you're interested in digging deep on the data, go to the dashboard, um, or you can also just go to the summary to just get a general flavor of, of what some of those comments were and where those comments were left. Um, so Carrie and I have gone through the comments, come up, we came up with a few themes, and we're also then going through each comment to see whether it's actionable um, and, and following up with other uh, departments as well to see, uh, bounce some ideas off of them as far as these recommendations go. Um, then moving on to our timeline for the next uh, few months. Again, just to recap where we've been, these topical meetings are really wrapping up over the next month or two. So next month we're going to be meeting with, or we have representatives from uh, Arundel Mills and Maryland Live Casino, as well as bringing back folks from Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation to talk about sort of just the gravity of, of that regional commercial center at Arundel Mills, and maybe even talk about then uh, the Maryland 198 uh, corridor as well, and, and maybe talk about, dig a little deeper about what some revitalization or economic development strategies might be for that area. Um, so we've got that in September. In October, we'll send this out over email, but we may need to bump this meeting up to October 6th, just so that Carrie and I can focus on visioning. Um, that's going to be uh, another public, another, another opportunity for the public to participate in this process. Um, and looking at November is where we would then, or lay back up, is towards the middle of September is when we'll start this, this community visioning process. We'll, we may leave that open for about 30, 45 days or so. And then once Carrie and I have had a chance to digest that information is when we'll bring that back to you all in November and we can start drafting a vision for the region plan then. Um, Given the holidays and everything, we may look to take December off. It'll give Carrie and I an opportunity to, again to just continue working on these goals, policies, and strategies, these recommendations that are going to be in the plan, so that in January and in you know brand new 2023, we can present those goals, policies, and strategies to you in draft form, as well as then get into the land use and zoning. So again, let me I'll back up here just a little bit to see sort of. Um, the, some more of the tasks that are taking place. Um, but again, wrapping up the topical meetings over the next two months, getting into public visioning, wrapping that up um, before the end of the year, and then starting our goals, policies, and strategies, and, and our actual mapping products in 2023, beginning of 2023. Okay, so here are some more specific dates. Um, Looking at the second and third and fourth bullet is, are the ones that are applying to, to our region plan specifically and, and the SAC. Um, but we do want to also make the plug for the county's um, pedestrian and bicycle master plan, the walk and roll plan that they're currently working on. They, they had their first public meeting last night. Their second one is August 31st. Go to that website, check it out, read the plan, and uh, you have until September 15th to also provide comments. So I think that's it for me. Any, any questions on that? Hope that was, again, check out the feedback map materials. Again, that's up on the our hub website. Okay. All right, well, great. Well, thanks everyone for sticking a little over. I know once again, we have uh, three, three really great presentations. So, um, and then we'll have another busy meeting in September to kind of talk about economic development. Um, but with that, I don't think, since we run over and I don't really think we've seen everybody from the public, we'll, uh, don't have any public comments, so I there, will go there ahead. There is, sorry, Joe, there is one hand raised, um, for public comment. Oh, is it? Okay. 
Yep. Okay. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll call on Gary Mahler and allow. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yep. Sorry, I did not see that. I just saw Jim's. Okay. All right, Gary, you have a minute. Okay, I, I I thought it was a very good meeting tonight. I appreciate it. Um, Forest community outreach. We're still getting uh, feedback that um, the SAC members are not opening and reading the emails that are being sent. That's concerning. Uh, I think that needs to be addressed. As far as the <clears throat> land goes, um, I had talked to the uh, fellow in charge of land for the Board of Education. He said he did not have any plans for that land uh, uh i guess it was about 20 or 30 acres um as kevin said we've been in jessup and been working to try to get that turned into a passive park for 15 20 years it goes back ages some of the people well two of the people already did alvira and, and mrs shannon so that that land uh is ready to, to move ahead on the the um we had a meeting last week with the county roads the YMCA building is maybe questionable as to whether they're going to take that out to as when they improve the intersection. Uh, but there's still a land there that could be turned into some useful uh, uh, applications, maybe a dog park or whatever. If he's still looking for more land, uh, we were just talking with the president of JIA over the weekend, and uh, what we're saying is there's a, a lot of land along race road going east up to the parkway large large amount of land i don't know what uh, if anybody has plans on it who owns it uh, john and lexi thinks that it's owned by the county i don't think so but if that gentleman uh, um, bruce is looking for a long large tract of land it's right there it's huge um so i'm, I'm going to try to get a hold of bruce um you know, and at the office, and maybe follow up on some of these issues with them, because uh, you know that what what we're seeing is the the housing has changed in Anne Arundel County. If you look at the older developments over in Severn, um, a lot of a lot of open space around the housing. But if you look at what's along 175 and Elm, Elm Street and Parkside, these people have no, I mean, they have no front yards. They have no backyards. And I think the uh, plan, plan and zoning needs to change the direction um, they're going in, in terms of providing uh, recreational places when we're, we're moving towards these very high density developments. Um, if you look at some of the materials on, on the web right now, Brookings Institute and others, uh, they're looking for a very high density. And if, you know, if the gentleman you had in there from Parks a couple months ago, had some papers that he actually wrote in college that talked about the social issues related to the size and availability of parks. And I think as we build up, as you remember, Mark, during Plan 2040, the, the, the thing that was, was spoken was when I asked the question, we're going to build up. And if you build up, I think we, we should uh, do the right thing for the people that are going to be living in these high-rise apartments and uh, provide uh, more than uh, a lot more recreational uh, assets than what we have now. So I think I'll probably talk more in a minute, so I'm sorry. All right, great, Gary, thank you so much. All right, and I think with that, that's um, the rest of our comments. So I guess I'll just look for a motion to adjourn. And Keisha, adjourn. Okay, and second? I'll second. All right, Kevin. All right, great. Well, thank you all so much. We appreciate it. And we will see everybody in September virtually. Thanks. Bye.